I can't spend hours waiting to withdraw cash when I deposit my salary here in the first place. It's either I queue up here or I have to pay a premium to a merchant for the convenience of cash. I've been here for an hour and then a senior citizen comes too. I can't let her ahead of me because I'm so behind time. It's inhuman, man. Come on. I don't know what is going on in there. And they just closed the branch near Westgate. Excuse me, ma'am. Ma Excuse me, ma'am. Ma we saw you coming out of a bank. What do you want from banks? I want my bank to lend me money. I have clients who want to buy my products. So I need cash up front to stop my products. All right. And do you think they're considering your application? What, how far are you? Yeah, they will. They will consider it. So I've got to hope that I'll buy my stock. The Zimbabwean economy comprises of 19 operational banks and 186 non-deposit taking micro lenders. Of the 19 banks, 13 are local and 6 are multinational. The market share occupied by the 5 most dominant banks is 70%. That is often referred to as a concentration ratio. The Zimbabwean market is relatively a competitive space for all participants. The concentration ratio in South Africa is 82%, in Kenya, 74%, and in Botswana, it's 72%. Zimbabwe's concentration ratio only got higher in 2020, with the big five penetrating deeper market share as shown as follows. Total assets for top five banks went from 58 to 66%. Total deposits went from 62 to 72%. And total loans rose from 66 to 75%. A discouraging outlook across banks in Zimbabwe has been the significant low revenues from the core business of lending. Revenues from lending, typically classified as interest income, contributed only 18% to banks' total income in 2020. This is far less than 79.5% from non-interest income. The country's central bank has received compliments for reducing non-performing loans and defaults that were once contagion risk for the entire sector several years ago. These defaults brought on reputational disgrace and public mistrust to banks due to insider loans and moral hazard to depositors' money. In 2012, NPLs reached 14.95% of the sector's loan book, but today they're now an inconsequential 0.31%. Besides the improved credit risk reforms imposed by the central bank, perhaps a greater motivator has been risk aversion by banks from lending altogether. This aversion to lending is compelled by the currency risk of the Zimbabwean dollar. In February 2019, the country abruptly decided to emerge from dollarization, introducing the Zimbabwean dollar, decoupling from a parity with the USD. By June 2020, the central bank created an interbank auction system, preempting effectively a steep devaluation of the local currency. In just two months, from June 2020 to August 2020, the official exchange rate shot from 1 to 32, elevating all the way up to 1 to 82. Here's what Chiesa Mazima, head of research at Global Risk Consultancy, Fitch Solutions thinks. The reality is that the Zimbabwean economy hasn't ever really effectively de-dollarized and in the local market, there's an overwhelming preference for um, hard currency. So this certainly speaks to and is uh, definitely symptomatic of the broader confidence deficit in the Zimbabwean market and policy uncertainty and money supply growth continues to feed into um, this confidence deficit and of course higher inflation uh, expectations. And essentially from a policy perspective, there needs to be 
greater efforts to move away from micromanaging the symptoms and rather a push towards addressing the real pain points and the systemic risks in the um, business environment. Another key aspect to look at is money supply. And a recent presentation by the Reserve Bank governor shows that they expect um, the required growth in money supply to hover at around 120% in 2021 and 50% in 2022. But at the same time, they also expect inflation to tick in at 32.6% um, next year. So there are concerns um, in the market about why money supply growth is set to run hot if the aim is to ensure that there aren't too many Zimbabwe dollars chasing too few goods and services, that there aren't too many Zimbabwe dollars chasing too few foreign currency units. The RBZ has been attending to inflation in its own capacity by practicing monetary targeting. It has a threshold for money supply growth. Reserve money supply and inflation have been found to have a positive correlation. Targeting has contributed to a significant decline in inflation from 837.5% in July 2020 to 56.4% in July 2021. The effects on confidence to lend are still distant. In the most recent MPC resolution, interest rates were moved from 40 to 60 percent so that real interest rates are above 54 percent inflation this means interest rates are still near neck and neck with inflation the average liquidity ratio of the banking sector remains more than double the rbz requirement of 30 percent standing at 67 percent the average loan to deposit ratio has dropped to 45%. A healthy LDR ratio should be 70%, meaning banks can still lend more. So, the question is, will banks invest it into lending or restructuring their organizations towards digital migration? Capital adequacy ratio benchmark of 12% set by the RBZ, the average in the banking sector is at 35%, while above this benchmark. Clearly, banks have some leverage to utilize capital. A notable occurrence just before and expedited by COVID-19 is digital migration. This could be a strategic imperative with an assumption that first movers could perhaps have advantage in penetrating the market. A publication that is thorough on technology in Zimbabwe is TechZim, and it has been pressing for more visibility of fintech regulation. To attract any sort of external attention, even local attention, especially in the fintech space, we need regular updates about how things are going, not just on a regulatory framework or framework or point of view, but with their fintech, with the fintech sandbox, for example. It's a brilliant thing getting people, startups, into one place that they deal with the regulator, that they get an inside look. But we need that information quickly. We need to know which startups the RBZ likes, which ideas they like, what are they toying with? Um, are there opportunities for other startups to come and, you know, even, you know, uh, daisy chain, you know, even, even in, a, in a reduced capacity in, in the fintech sandbox? The more people see this, that kind of thing, the more it will attract attention. People now know what the regulator is, is looking for, what they aren't looking for. And even if, even between what they're looking for and they're not, the gaps in between will inspire an entrepreneur. They'll be like, right, they are not looking for this. It exists between that and that. Therefore, I should go for that. Again, that's how the market blooms. That's how we get investment. That's how we get progress. So as much as, as it's a good thing, we just need everything to be regular and live. And we need regular reports. I'm not saying weekly, but something in the region of monthly that we know what they're working with, uh, not something, you know, in press statements, but even live video from the governor himself describing his own experience, the, the head of the, the sandbox uh, describing the experience. The regulator or regulation, whatever it is, that comes from the top down, 
Um, the fintech sandbox is a brilliant idea, a brilliant example of what has come to the fintech space recently. Brilliant innovation. Um, it will allow banks, as, as people already know, to work with uh, fintech startups. But the thing we want the most is information. Armed with the insight and apprehensions of TechSim, we engaged the RBZ Deputy Governor in charge of FinTech. I, I think, well, it's an uneven space, obviously, uh, because in both ways, number one, banks already have, a, they, they, they have a first mover advantage in the sense that they're already sitting there and they are well resourced to, to compete. Uh, but they're not nimble enough, like someone sitting in their garage or in their father's study room and, and coming up with these products. Uh, and, and, and the advantage of, 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 um, of, of a guy sitting in their garage and coming up with an innovative financial product is that they generally are not encumbered by regulation. So what, we've, what, what we want to try and do ourselves is to say, instead of us insisting that somebody fully complies with the regulations that we have. Let them go into the sandbox first. A common misconception in the tech industry is that central banks not only favor banks, but nullify intellectual property. Smart investors should understand a nuance. It should not be the role of a central bank to regulate a technology. Um, First of all, because we don't have expertise in, in that area. But secondly, in general, when you regulate, when you regulate from lack of expertise, you kill innovation. So if central banks started regulating technologies, then it could kill innovation. But what we would be interested in as central bank is how a financial product is delivered to a consumer uh, or to the public, let me put it that way. So if, 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 if a fintech has a technology that delivers an existing or a new product in a most efficient and uh, quick way, but also in a, in a way that uh, maintains the integrity of the financial system, that's what you should worry about. Uh, it's only when a product harms consumer interests that we really get concerned and say, we, we can't allow this product. But if it's not doing any of those things, I'm really happy to allow it to operate. Because really what we want of what we want is financial stability, consumer protection. Investors looking to capitalize on fintech reforms should look out for entities that are breaking through the central bank sandbox. We understood the advantages of, of fintech or digital financial services, but also understood that it can go down south. When it goes down south, it's the central bank that people will come and say, why did you not protect us against this? So we needed a test environment. And this is where the directory sandbox comes in. It provides a test environment for, um, for, 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 for startups who want to test their products away from the stringent regulatory requirements that exist, for example, for banks. Uh, for in insurance industry for insurance companies. So it provides them that test environment, but it also give us, gives us an opportunity to understand the product and to understand whether the existing regulatory laws can be customized in that direction or whether we need to update them in some sort of way. So it's, it's both a learning environment for us, but it also allows us to, to to, be a, to, 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 to anticipate any potential uh, risks that may go to the consumer or, or it may disturb financial stability and price stability or macroeconomic stability, which is what we care about. First of all, we have uh, actually, the, we've been very encouraged by the interest that uh, the startups have shown in the sandbox. Right now we have uh, over, um, over, over 60, uh, uh, people that have come to the sandbox and they're coming from various countries, uh, from Zimbabwe, majority from Zimbabwe, but from South Africa, from the UK, from China, uh, from the US. For an effective digital migration strategy, a best model is banks partnering with developers 
or banks utilizing open source software. This is different to other technology industries which are winner-take-all based on proprietary IP or monopolizing a platform as a route to market, setting barriers for competitors. That's not the model to pursue in monetary environment. We designated ZimSwitch uh, as a national switch now and the government through a visit acquired certain I can't remember the number of shares in, into Zim switch so that we can we, we can make it a national switch that 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 that, that allows operate interoperability between the different networks what the deputy governor is saying can apply for a centralized credit or collateral registry maybe even a system for bureau de change so there is a huge gap in terms of an opportunity to bridge that, right? To centralize, you know, whether it is a financial documents or um, customer KYC type of initiatives to actually allow, um, whether it's the banks or, you know, companies to access certain information to make quicker decision making and processes. When we speak about lack of um, trust in, 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 the, in the system, it's exactly that, right? Um, there's a lot of schemes that the government is running. I know we've, we've got the command scheme um, where someone can get inputs, um, they have a bumper harvest, and um, when they get paid for their inputs, they get paid into a different bank account than the one that actually paid out, right? And what does that do? It means that the bank that actually gave the loan is prejudiced from that money because the money is now somewhere else and that bank cannot collect. So if you have a central system that actually acknowledges that or identifies that you got a loan from let's call it Bank A, when you get paid out for the bumper harvest from the Grain Marketing Board or from whatever entity, um, your payout goes into a specific bank account where your loan was originated from. It's easy to put those systems in place, right? Um, but what that does, it creates accountability on the borrower and it creates less risk from the banking, uh, for the banks to be able to um, manage and um, reduce the risks of those um, types of loans. We spoke to Tano Digital, an ERP software provider and manager. He spoke on the demand for digital migration by banks. So ERP creates the baseline for your digital transformation journey, right? And it enables a lot of digital processes. Um, so for example, banks now are you know, moving away from the traditional uh, banking where you have people queuing up in you know, in the, in the branches. Um, look, um, the rest of the region, I think if you look in South Africa, you know, some of those banks are scaling down in terms of the number of branches and actually having self-service branches where users or customers can actually go in and sell themselves, uh, self, uh, self-serve um, to do transactions. Um, so, you know, the ERPs, you know, create a baseline where you have your CRM, your customer relationship management, um, solutions that you know that enable customers to interact with your you know with your systems. Um, it creates um, you know some efficiencies within the banks itself, right? So, for example, your human resources departments and banks um, don't necessarily need to uh, manually approve timesheets, or you know you know employees can actually go on into a portal, submit timesheet, leave requests. Um, you know, material managers or supervisors can approve purchase orders and do all those things electronically without physically doing the document um, olden way of doing things. So, yeah, it definitely does create a baseline um, for companies to be able to digitize and then do more aggressive and um, interesting stuff with their digital transformation journey. Benefits of, of digitization, you can scale up, scale down. Um, as required, right? So if your company grows from 10 people to 100 people, if you have a hosted solution that's in the cloud, it's as easy as just scaling up, uh, you know, getting additional capacity in terms of compute and storage if, you're, you know, if it's from an infrastructure perspective. Um, and then you also have, you know, solutions that are software as a services, licenses as a services, um, which allow you to just add on users, you know, as opposed to uh, doing the traditional perpetual licensing type of business. So yeah, definitely, if you're in a digital environment, it allows you to be more agile in terms of being able to change your course, increase, decrease, or even correct if required at a, you know, at a flat.
an entity that has been able to create a desirable product that enhances the financial services ecosystem and gain market share for itself is Mukuru. Mukuru is also in the exponentially growing segment that captures remittances. There was another transition in 2016 in Zimbabwe with the shortage of cash where we introduced our own physical orange booths and the technology that supports it to manage distribution and logistics of cash to customers to collect. And so essentially we are a fintech company building the next gen fintech platform and with a flexible network for reach and, and to try and crack the financial inclusion nut uh, as remotely as possible. So currently in Zimbabwe, we are approaching about 200 service points and those are, the majority of them are the orange booths. And we also work with the local partners. Uh, so the traditional partners would be our banks. We work with wholesalers and retailers uh, to extend our footprint as far as we can and make the service as ubiquitous as possible. So we canvas clients that come into the more remote nodes that we have in our network, uh, asking them generally where have they come from, where would they like to send to, and the gathering of that information will give us insight into saying, okay, there's, possible, there's a possible uh, additional point in Chipinga that would do well. Um, so the movement of the market and gathering of that intel informs our opinion on where to place the booth region. Mukuru was able to emerge as a leader to offer a growing service of facilitating money transfer. So we are an authorized dealer with limited authority, tier one, um, and essentially that means that we can receive money from a board, send money out and remit money domestically, and we can also do bureau transactions. Mukuru found its regulatory opportunity in its alignment with financial inclusion. Notice the coherence with Deputy Governor Chipika's sentiments. The components, therefore, of financial inclusion include, number one, actual access, accessibility of financial services to the majority of the population, concentration being on the marginalized segments of the population. Number two is usage of those financial services, which speaks to appropriateness of the financial products and services to meet the consumer's needs. The third one is the quality of the financial services. It must be high quality, nothing substandard and so on. Affordability is key because we are reaching out to marginalized groups. So if the financial products and services are too expensive, they will not be able to take them up. And then number five, which is a key component of financial inclusion, is sustainability. How sustainable are the financial initiatives that we are rolling out to the population of Zimbabwe, particularly the marginalized? Our approach is extremely local. It is very much a, a customer first understanding of what a need would be rather than the development of a fintech platform that would then be overlaid over a, a particular situation. The extended reach and uh, ability to tackle the financial inclusion question um, is what we work really hard towards. That uh, is one of the key reasons for our uh, vertical networks that we have in each of the countries a face-to-face -face interaction with troubleshooting, frequently asked questions, even going through exactly step-by-step -step what needs to be done so that you can complete your know your customer requirements, the particular onboarding details that we would need. The speaking in a convenient location in your own language, I think is an essential part of winning over trust from customers who are weary of uh, making a financial uh, decision and making the wrong financial decision. So th th that I think is a, is a very key differentiator for us. Then that generality of the marginalized population, the groups we are talking about, they lack knowledge of financial products and services. What is out there for them in the formal finance which can help them to improve their lives? They didn't know. Some also of the products churned out by the financial institutions were inappropriate because the financial institutions were not 
seeing this as a credible market to go to. So they would design products that were meant for corporates, for, for people in formal employment. In the meantime, the majority of the people are in rural areas in the informal sector. So inappropriateness of products. Again, another thing we came across and we are still struggling with that one is lack of confidence in the financial system because of the hyperinflationary period we experienced from 2000 to 2008. And it was associated also sometimes with some bank failures. So it eroded the population's confidence in the banking system. And sometimes when we now go and say financial inclusion, bring your money to the banks, we want to deal with you, they flash back on that period and say we will lose out. The first target was to increase the overall level of access to affordable and appropriate formal financial services within the country from 69%, which was measured then in 2014, to at least 90% by 2020. And when I give you some of our tracking, I think we have achieved this one. The second one was to increase the proportion of banked adults from 30% in 2014 to at least 60% by 2020. Yes, so these were the main ones, but they were sub, because you, then you can look at the women, the youth, the SMEs, and so on. But these were the main ones that, that uh, guided us under financial inclusion phase one. And you can see that because the program was starting in Zimbabwe, we had to concentrate on access. Access was the key thing. Because you can't talk of quality usage if your people don't even have a bank account. They are not even linked to the formal finance. So we concentrated on access and financial literacy itself. We did a lot on that. Because we knew that once that is done, scaling up now to usage, to quality, becomes easier in phase two and beyond. The Zimbabwean financial services industry is growing. Market share remains up for grabs, with continuous improvement by the central bank to manage inflation and somehow grow confidence in the local currency. The Zimbabwean market can create investor value. A lot remains to be seen.